Steve, we're really delighted to have you here. And, uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure to be here. Able to rec recognize your accomplishments. I guess my uh, question that I might have is just one of protocol. How do you really refer to an astronaut? Do we call you Astronaut Swanson? Do we call you Mr. Swanson? Do we call you Dr. Swanson? Steve works well. Steve works well. <laughs> That's what we've been doing. Uh, <laughs> Back to campus? No, I've not. I have not been back. And how many years did that? Now you made me do math in public now? <laughs> <laughs> many years, yes. Well, I'm going to say it's changed quite a bit since then. Uh, you have trees now, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> At the time you were here, it was probably all runways and neighbors. Exactly. It wasn't very much. It's still a very good school, though. Did you live on campus? No, I did not. It was up at Delray Beach. Okay. So you've seen a lot of changes there at Delray as well. Yeah. Steve, uh, NASA's getting ready to go back to the moon and eventually on to Mars. And my understanding is that uh, the trip to Mars will be a year to get there. It's uh, probably yeah, nine months to get there. Be there a year or like a year to come back. That has to be a whole different ballgame to consider the weather going up and spending a few days on it. It is. Uh, that is a long trip. Uh, it's a nine months there, a year and a half there, and nine months to get back. And that just has to do with the way the orbits work between the Earth and Mars. That's how you have to do it. Uh, what it means, though, is that the, when you go, you are by yourself. There's no way to come back quickly. There's no way to send help. You're definitely truly on your own. And that's why we have to do these stepping stones with the space station finish up, get some more money out of that, then go on to the moon, get a lunar base there, uh, understand how all that works, actually having a base, how to live. As you say, we're in, a, in a, an environment where you can do it all by yourself. You don't need any help. We have to learn how to do that. We have to get the technology up to that ability. And right now, we don't have that. So we need to do these things. Doctor, how confident are you that NASA will be on a, what seems to be a pretty aggressive timetable to complete this shuttle program and then go uh, beyond the moon and Mars? Well, right now, we're, we're doing pretty well in keeping with our timetable. I do believe we'll finish the uh, shuttle and station on time uh, as proposed. Uh, we're on time to, to make the new vehicles coming online. Of course, we're always are dependent upon Congress and the money we get. So that's uh, always an issue, but every year we fight for what we can get. Uh, but as long as we do get that, I do believe we, we can make that in time. How do you translate, by the way, the, the great support that astronauts like you have in the public, and I know you know in the astronaut corps are very popular, translate that into uh, support in Congress for funding, which sometimes doesn't seem to be uh, to match that level of uh, pride that the, uh, the public has in its space program. And that's a difficult problem we do face. Uh, one, there are rules against us actually going out and trying to solicit money because it's to be your government organization and you're not allowed to go out and try to even tell, you know, work with Congress and try to get your support. That's not uh, one thing we can really do. Uh, but we do just try to do it more in the logical, show to the Congress and those people that uh, the benefits of NASA and what we do. And one of that is, of course, showing how the, the public is behind it, and that does help tremendously with that. But uh, they also have many other things to deal with, though, in their, in their lives, and, and you know, balancing the budget and, and doing all that kind of stuff. It's not an easy job for them, so it's, it's, we have to just you know, do our best to try to convince them that it is the right thing to do. Do you think there's a future in uh, privatizing the space program uh, at some point so you can attract more uh, investment and, and uh, sort of un unleash the uh, program from the constraints of uh, the bureaucracy? I, I think at some time, that it, we'd like to go that way, and sometimes it is possible. The problem right now is it's just not really cost effective at this time for a business to take that over. I even though I wish it would be that way, there's just so much overhead and actually getting the launch off and doing that, that it isn't cost effective for what you get back. And uh, so we have to you know, weigh those kind of costs. And hopefully someday they'll get the technology to bring that cost down and then we can do it the better and more in a private industry type fashion. I think we have some future executives. Oh yeah, I have future astronauts, I'm sure. Because you know, the way I look at that too is, is you know, this whole moon and Mars thing. We don't, we're going to go back to the moon in 2020. And Mars is probably 2030, 2035. And I'll be retired by then. And there'll be a whole new generation of people out there who are going to be astronauts. And they're from that age group we have right out here. And that's a big difference. What was it that you the FAU for that degree? The beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, it was a, my undergraduate was at the University of Colorado, and it was slightly true that I was looking for a school that was a little different than the mountains of Colorado. Even though I love them very much, I wanted to see what the other places of the United States were like, and, and one of those little in the back of my mind was, you know, Beach would be really nice. And so I did do that, but I happened to luck out and find a very good school at the same time. So it satisfied me. You first climbed into the vehicle. That's the first time you realize that you're really going, because you never know. With nasty, you have delays and delays, possibly, or something could come up. So when you climb into the vehicle for the first time, you're, that's when you realize probably you're actually going to get to go. That's kind of an exciting feeling. But you also realize you're sitting on about four and a half million pounds of uh, explosive material <laughs> designed by the lowest bidder. And, <laughs> So, so it does give you a little bit of, you know, another feeling in there too, a little bit, but then you make you sit on your back for two hours, and after that, you're just ready to do anything, so you're ready to go, and then the launch is a fantastic experience, it's very exciting, uh, but once you get to space, and they don't really give you any time though, to really think about it and feel about it, because you're busy right away at work and trying to change the space shuttle into a launch vehicle, into an orbiting vehicle, and so you're very busy, but the really time that you first realize you're really in space, and things are different, is when you go get ready for bed that night. You still have to do the same stuff. You still have to try to brush your teeth, all that kind of stuff, get a little bite to eat, all that kind of stuff. And that's when you realize that you're, you know, and you, you were sleeping a little sleep back, that yeah, things are really different up here. Everything's floating away, I can't control it. You know, making a mess with my food, it floats off. And it takes a while to figure all that out. But, but the, the feeling is it's just a wonderful time because you uh, trained a long time of your life and worked hard to get here. It was a great accomplishment. Steve, we really thank you for coming and sharing oh, my your pleasure. experiences with us. And